by transcription. Mother, is Maxwell House the best coffee in the whole world? Well, your father says so, and your father knows best. Yes, it's Father Knows Best, starring Robert Young as father. A half-hour visit with your new neighbors, the Andersons. Brought to you by Maxwell House, the coffee that's bought and enjoyed by more people than any other brand of coffee at any price. Maxwell House, always good to the last drop. Well, another year is underway. All the excitement of Christmas and New Year's is over. But in the average home, the usual problems of life and living still remain. In Springfield, in the white frame house on Maple Street, the Andersons, like any average family, are back in a well-ordered group. But being an average family, you can bet they won't stay there very long. They never do, do they? Mother? Yes, Kathy? When I finish my dinner, may I go over to Patty Davis's? All right, dear, if you don't stay too long. Mother, how can she? This is her week to dry. Oh, that's right. I'm sorry, Kathy, I forgot. Snitcher. <laughs> Kathy, please be quiet and eat your dinner. All right, Daddy. Mom. Yes, bud? I'll be glad to dry the dishes to Kathy. You will? Well, that's very nice, dear. But it's Kathy's chore, and she'd better do it herself. Gee whiz. <laughs> Margaret. Uh, yes, dear? You know, it's very funny, but I could have sworn I heard Bud say he'd dry the dishes for Kathy. I did. You said you'd dry the dishes for Kathy? Sure. You mean just like that? Sure, why not? You know, I think I've been working too hard. <laughs> <laughs> Everything sounds so strange. <laughs> it was the holidays, dear. They're quite a strain. Well, it's something. You uh, feel all right, don't you, Bud? I feel fine. Maybe I'll go to bed right after dinner. That ought to fix me up. <laughs> but, dear, I told you Judge Mitchell said he was going to call. He's been trying to get you all day. I know. Probably wants me to serve on that highway safety committee. You know, Margaret, you'd think I was the only man in Springfield that could make a speech. Every time somebody dreams up a committee or a drive or a bond rally, get Jim Anderson, get Jim Anderson. Speeches here, speeches there. Jim, you love it and you know it. But I don't have the time. I don't think I've ever been so busy in my entire life. Anything we can do, Father? No, Betty, I'm afraid not. You know what I've got to do now, Margaret? I've got to revise the schedule on every automobile policy in the office. The rates went up again today. No, Jim, really? How come, Dad? Reckless drivers, that's how come. Oh. 7,100 kids between the ages of 15 and 24 killed in one year. And it's getting worse all the time. Bud... Yes, Dan? Did you take the ashes out this afternoon? Yes, sir, I sure did. Uh, you don't have a report card you want me to sign, do you? Oh, no, Dad. We won't have those until the end of the month. I see. Uh, how's your allowance holding up? Fine, Dad, just great. I don't get it. May I have my coffee, please? Of course, dear. There you are. You don't get what, Dad? This sudden burst of sweetness and light. What are you up to? Why, nothing, Dad, nothing at all. He's probably in love. Oh, mush, girls. All they can think about is love. I'll get it. No, Betty, wait. Uh, Margaret, would you answer it, please? Well, of course, dear, if that's what you want. And if it's Judge Mitchell, tell him I'm out. I um, had a business engagement and won't be back until late. All right, I just hope you know what you're doing. Hello? Oh, hello, Judge Mitchell. No, I'm awfully sorry, but Jim had to go out. Yes, a, a business call. Daddy. Kathy, be quiet, please. <laughs> That'll be fine, Judge Mitchell. I'll be sure to tell him as soon as he comes in. Good night. Daddy. What is it, Kathy? You told a fib. <laughs> I did no such thing. Jim, Judge Mitchell said he'd try you again later. Fine. Give him a horse and he'd make a Canadian mount. He looks sick. You said you were out and you weren't out. And if that isn't a fib, what is? I, uh, 
I think I'll have another piece of cake, Margaret. <laughs> All right, dear. Daddy. Yes, Kathy. You said you were out and you weren't out. And if that isn't a fib, what is? Kathy, I heard you the first time. Well? <laughs> Margaret. Oh, no, don't get me involved in this. I have enough troubles of my own. Love, honor, and obey. For better or for worse. <laughs> Fine stuff. Um, uh, Kathy. Yes, Daddy? As you grow older, you learn to distinguish between telling an untruth and, uh, telling something that isn't true. <laughs> I mean, if you tell an untruth because you're afraid to tell the truth, it's worse than if you don't tell the truth merely because you feel that if you do tell the truth... <clears throat> you see, Kathy... <laughs> There are times when if you tell an untruth, it isn't really an untruth, because you mean to tell the truth, but, well, you, you want to be kind, that's all. <laughs> Betty, please. You ought to be ashamed of yourself, Betty. Go ahead, Dad. I think it's very interesting. <laughs> What is? What you just said. You mean you understood it? Of course. Well, I'm glad somebody did. <laughs> How about you, Kathy? I guess so. It's a fib when you're little, but when you grow up, it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, Kathy, that isn't it at all. It's, well, all right, I told a fib. I shouldn't have, but I did. That's what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy, can't you see Dad's tired? Why don't you leave him alone? Bud, stick out your tongue. What for? <laughs> Never mind what for. Just stick your tongue out. Uh... <clears throat> Look all right to you, Margaret? Just beautiful, dear. One of the loveliest tongues I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Bud. Put it back in. <laughs> Holy cow, now I can't even have any privacy with my own tongue. Finish your milk, dear. Well, how old do you have to be before people stop looking at your tongue anyway? When you get that old, you start looking at it yourself. <laughs> All right, bud, please see who's at the door. Okay. Why don't you look at Betty's tongue once in a while? She's goofier than anybody. Why, Bud Anderson, you little snip. Betty, that'll be enough of that. But, Father... I said that'll be enough of that. Now, either finish your dinner or go to your room. Oh, I'll be glad to. After you finish the dishes. Oh. May I have the sugar, please? Yeah, there you are, dear. Tell me I'm goofy. <laughs> Say, Dad, it's the minister. Dr. Swain? Well, have him come in. Oh, he said he'll wait for you in the living room. Oh, dear, is, is my hair all right? Do you think I ought to change my dress? You and Dr. Swain going out dancing? <laughs> <laughs> Jim, stop being ridiculous. Uh, Bud, will you help the girls with the dishes tonight, please? Sure, Mom. I'll be glad to. Thank you, dear. Well, shall we go in, Jim? Hmm? Oh, sure. Say, Margaret. Yes, dear? What do you suppose is wrong with Bud? Jim, you have a very suspicious nature. No, I just have a very normal son. Well, how are you, Dr. Swain? Mr. Anderson and Mrs. Anderson. Oh, it's so nice seeing you, Dr. Swain. Well... I hope you'll think so after you learn why I'm here. Oh? Uh, sit down, Doctor, please. Mrs. Anderson? Well, thank you. Ah, there we are. <clears throat> that is better, isn't it? Uh, Dr. Swain, this visit wouldn't have anything to do with Bud, would it? Your son? Oh, dear, no. Is anything wrong? No, I was just wondering, that's all. I see. No, no, my visit is based, shall we say, uh, on a far more general community requirement a need which applies to our entire congregation rather than any individual. Uh, Dr. Swain, you know, we've just gone through a pretty severe case of Christmas, and... Uh, Jim, please. Well, I just want Dr. Swain to know. Mr. Anderson, I'm not looking for donations. Well. <laughs> At this time. Oh. <laughs> no, no, what I'm looking for right now is advice. Oh. Well, uh, you see, at a meeting the other night, the question of family relations was brought up for discussion. Obligations of parents and children to one another. Uh, that sort of thing, you know. I see. Unfortunately, the majority of those present 
had rather vague ideas concerning the matter under discussion. And since Mrs. Swain and I have never been blessed with a family, I could add but little light on the subject, of a practical nature, that is. <clears throat> uh, that is why I've come to you. Well, of course, Dr. Swain. Uh, anything we can do to help? Ah, uh, I knew I could count on the Anderson. As I told the others, the Anderson children are so thoroughly normal and so nicely behaved, uh, for the most part. <laughs> I'm sure anything their parents tell us will be of the utmost interest and assistance. Oh, you mean you want a speech? Well, well, not a speech, really. Just an informative little talk at our meeting tomorrow night. Oh, well, look, Dr. Swain, you know I'd like to help, but I'm actually up to my ears at work. Well, I'm sure you must be, Mr. Anderson, but you see that... It's not that I don't want to cooperate, Dr. Swain. You know I always have in the past. Of course you have, but you see But that after is... all, this is just a simple problem. I'm sure that any other father in the congregation will be only too glad to help you. But, Mr. Anderson, we don't want a father. After all, family relations are merely a practical application of... You what? <laughs> we don't want a father. We feel that the crystal clear viewpoint of a mother is what this particular problem requires. A mother? You mean... Precisely. We want Mrs. Anderson. Oh. We'll go along with Dr. Swain on that. Why, any number of problems call for mother's crystal clear viewpoint. Take coffee as another example. Who knows better than mother the wonderful difference a really good cup of coffee can make? Coffee like our Maxwell House. Mmm, that wonderful good to the last drop flavor. You won't find it, you know, in any other coffee. No coffee but Maxwell House. And there's a particular reason why. It's a recipe. The only recipe under the sun for good to the last drop flavor. It's mighty important, that recipe. And here's why. After all, the most important thing about coffee is flavor. And that flavor depends on the blend, the kind of coffees in it, and how they're put together. Now, throughout the world, coffee grows in countless different varieties. And you can combine them in all sorts of ways. But there's only one way, one recipe for our famous Maxwell House flavor. And this recipe of ours accounts for the difference, the big difference between the flavor of just any coffee and the wonderfully good flavor of America's favorite brand. But I want you to know how truly good our Maxwell House is on your own. So tomorrow, open up a pound and enjoy Maxwell House, the coffee that's always good to the last drop. <laughs> It's less than an hour later in the white frame house on Maple Street. Dr. Swain is gone. The Anderson kids are deep in their homework. Father is deep in his newspaper. Mother is up to her neck in preparation for a speech. And when it comes to speeches, Margaret is a wonderful cook. Pretty, too. Jim. Yes, Margaret? What would you say was the most important link between a father and a son? Money. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, I'm very serious So am I May I please read my paper? If I could only find a central theme Not juvenile delinquency Everybody's done that Jim Yes, Margaret Did the automobile insurance rates really go up today? That's right Did the home office say why? Of course they did The number of accidents involving youngsters under the age of Oh, no, you don't <laughs> You write your own speech. You're mean. There isn't one other husband in Springfield who wouldn't be glad to help his wife. Margaret, you're absolutely right. I'm nothing but a beast. You mean you're going to help me? No, but I acknowledge the fact that I'm a beast. <laughs> now, may I read my paper? Jim, if you wanted to make the speech, why didn't you say so? If I wanted... Margaret, where did you ever get a ridiculous idea like that? Well, you're sulking like a spoiled child. I'm trying to read my newspaper. It amounts to the same thing. Margaret, I told Dr. Swain I didn't want to make the speech. You heard me tell him. Rubbish. You just wanted him to coax you. Oh, for Pete's sake. Margaret, why is... 
Certainly isn't my fault that he wanted a mother's viewpoint. Jim, where are you going? I'm going to indulge in one of my pleasant little whimsies. When the doorbell rings, I like to see if maybe somebody rang it. Hello, Jim. Oh, uh, hello, Judge Mitchell. Uh, come in. Thank you. Well, it's certainly nice seeing you. I'm sorry I wasn't in when you called. Uh, let me take your thing. All right. Hello, Mrs. Anderson. How are you this evening? Why, well, Judge Mitchell, what a pleasant surprise. Won't you come in and sit down? Yes, thank you. Jim, uh, what I have to say won't take very long. There's no need to rush, Judge. You know, I was just saying to Margaret just a little while ago, the fathers of this community ought to take a more active interest in public affairs. Wasn't I, Margaret? Weren't you what, dear? Wasn't I saying what I just said? <laughs> oh, of course, yes. Naturally, being in the insurance business, I have to make a great many calls during the uh, evening, but in spite of Jim, that... Jim, uh, I'm sure you're leading up to something very interesting, but I'm a busy man and I haven't got much time. Is Bud at home? Why, uh, yes, he's in his room. Oh, would you call him, please? Of course. Uh, Bud! You want me, Dad? Yes, would you please come down here? Okay. Bud and the stairs don't get along very well. If there's anything that you want me to do, Dad, I... Uh-oh. Good evening, Bud. Bud, Judge Mitchell is speaking to you. I know. I mean, hello. Uh, good evening, sir. Bud, have you told your parents? No, sir, I haven't. Oh, there was something. I had a feeling. Well, go ahead, Bud. Let's get on with it. Dad, uh, Mom, I was out for a ride with the fellas this afternoon, and we, uh, we knocked over Judge Mitchell's tree. His tree? Oh, Bud. What were you driving, a tank? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it was just a little tree, Dad, and all the fellas are going to chip in and buy a new one. Gosh, we said we were sorry. I should think you would be. Judge Mitchell, Bud and his friends will replace your tree. I give you my word. Jim, it's not the tree that bothers me. You mean there's more? Well, my principal concern is the manner in which the tree was destroyed. Tell him, Bud. Well, we were playing chicken. Bud, after all I've said to you... Jim, I'm afraid I don't understand. What is chicken? Oh, it's a game these kids thought of. We didn't think it up, Dan. Well, whoever did ought to have his head examined. If he still has a head. Driving a car at full speed with nobody holding the wheel. And the first one who gets a little sense into his thick skull and tries to control the car, he's chicken and he loses. Oh, Bud, how could you? Gosh, Mom, everybody does it. And if all the fellas hadn't gotten chicken at the same time, we'd have been all right. But, well, everybody grabbed for the wheel at once and... Heck, it was only a tree... It was only a tree. Bud, you can kneel down and thank all of your guardian angels that it was only a tree. What if your mother had been standing where that tree was? Or Betty, or Kathy? Would you have been able to stop any sooner or steer any better? No, I, I guess not. You guess not? Well, we'll go into this matter in great detail, believe me. Judge Mitchell. Yes, Jim? Bud was wrong. But I want you to know that I feel he isn't solely to blame. Oh, I suppose not, but... Uh... It's, uh, I don't mean the other boys. I have reference to myself. Oh? I'm going to be very honest, Judge Mitchell, very frank. I owe you a very humble apology. You mean for not being home so consistently? I, uh, avoided you all day. Because I thought you wanted me to serve on your highway, highway safety, safety committee. I thought I was too busy. I'd let someone else take care of it. After all, my son was a competent driver. Why worry about the other fellow's problem? Well, Judge Mitchell, my son is not a competent driver. And the fault is mine. I taught him the mechanics of driving, how to start and stop a car and how to steer. But I failed to teach him the responsibility that goes with a car. I put a ton of steel in his hands, a weapon as deadly as any gun. And I failed to impress upon his mind the fact that when he's in a car, he holds the power of life and death in his fingertips. But he's going to be taught, Judge Mitchell. Before he touches a steering wheel again, he's going to know the full meaning of his responsibility. The car is not a toy. It's not an instrument for childish games. 
And he'll drive sensibly, safely, courteously, or I give you my word, he'll never drive again. Now, um, about the tree... Uh... Well, we can just forget the tree, Jim. Let's say that it died for worthy cause. Jim. Yes, Margaret? Do you know what you just did? You just gave my speech. Oh, well, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to muscle in on your territory. <laughs> oh, Jim, will you please stop being silly? Why don't you go along with me tomorrow and tell the same things to the other parents? I think they learn a great deal. Margaret, you know I don't want to make any speeches. Well, whatever you say, dear. But as long as you insist, I, uh... <laughs> Well, I guess I might as well. <laughs> All right, dear. Father knows best. So Father's going to make his speech after all. Well, that's fine, because he does have something important to say. And right now, so do I. These days, when you buy coffee, you want the most in flavor for every penny you spend. After all, flavor's what you're paying for. And we don't think you can beat the famous flavor we pack into every pound of Maxwell House. But here's the point. Air can steal coffee flavor. And ordinary containers, like paper bags, can't prevent roasted coffee from losing flavor, whether it's ground or whole bean. That's why we take our Maxwell House, still fresh and fragrant from our roasting ovens, and carefully vacuum pack it in the familiar blue tin. That way, no air gets in, and none of that wonderful flavor gets out. So the next pound of coffee you buy, be sure you get all the flavor and fragrance you pay for. You will with Maxwell House coffee. Always good to the last drop. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, tonight Father Knows Best is honored by a celebrated and rather unusual guest. An article concerning him and his wonderful work appeared in the November issue of Liberty Magazine and was reprinted in the December issue of Reader's Digest. That takes care of the celebrated part of it. As for the unusual, well, so far as I know, he is the only traffic court judge in the history of the United States ever to have warranted the use of the term popular. It's an honor and a very great privilege to introduce a young man who has made the city of Los Angeles a safer place in which to live. Judge Roger Fah. Thank you. Good evening, Bob. Uh, Your Honor, I, uh, <laughs> doggone, I just can't get used to feeling comfortable with a traffic court judge. I feel like I've just gone through a red light or something. Well, that'll be $25. <laughs> I said, I feel like I've gone through it. Well, in that case, we'll suspend sentence. But don't let it happen again. Oh, thank you, Judge Fah. I uh, believe you know what we on Father Knows Best are trying to accomplish. I do, Bob. And I can't recommend too highly or endorse more heartily the program you are spearheading. The question of accidents involving young drivers and the unfortunate incidence of traffic casualties and fatalities has become a serious problem in every community in the nation. Something has to be done about it, and fast. You see, Bob, if it were a single problem, we could cope with it quite easily. If all the teenage drivers were incompetent or careless, we could insist that they avail themselves of the driver education and training courses being given in many high schools throughout America. A great many boys and girls have taken these courses and are taking them right now. But our problem is with competent drivers, skilled drivers, the youngster who is so confident of his ability that he takes ridiculous chances with his life and yours. Less than a year ago, a lad was brought into my courtroom on a charge so fantastic that it is almost unbelievable. This boy was driving a car in excess of 55 miles an hour without a steering wheel. Well, there's, there's only one... Uh... Suitable comment for that. Bud's favorite and all-inclusive, holy cow. This boy was steering with a pair of pliers, and he was so confident of his ability that he couldn't for the life of him understand why we considered him a potential murderer. You see, Bob, that's the way these boys and girls must think of themselves. 
whenever they take those wild split-second chances, whenever they play chicken or hubcap tag or any of their other reckless and ridiculous games. In spite of their skill, which we do not question, in spite of their youth, which gives them reflexes much faster than yours or mine, these drivers are death on wheels. There are accidents going somewhere to happen. Well, Judge Poff, you don't mean that, of course, to apply to all young drivers. Oh, no, Bob, of course not. Most of them, I know, are sensible, intelligent youngsters. But it's hard to tell the innocent from the guilty, and so they all get a bad name. That's why I think the highway safety plan, as you explained it to me, should be welcomed by the young drivers. Why don't you tell them about it? Okay, I'll do it right now. Through the Inter-Industry Highway Safety Committee, which was formed at the request of President Truman, two clubs have been set up, a man-to-man club for fathers and sons and a counterpart on the distaff side for dads and daughters. Voluntary good driver agreements are provided for. These are agreements between parents and children to be signed by both, and they involve pledges on both sides. The father promises to grant permission to his son or daughter to drive the family car at appropriate times. And the youngster, well, he or she has to promise to abide by eight good driving rules. But they're sensible rules designed not to take the joy out of life, but rather to give you a longer life to enjoy. With each man-to-man or dad-to-daughter agreement, there is a membership card. And I'd like to see them riding in teenage pockets and hat bands all over the country. You know, Bob, that's quite an idea. Those membership cards will help to separate the black sheep from the innocence of the flock. The youngsters who are careful drivers, intelligent drivers, will no longer have to protest that it's the other fellow who takes chances, the other fellow who plays the wild games, the other fellow who gives all drivers a bad name. They can prove, by living up to the terms of these membership cards, that they have a right to the respect of their elders and a right to share the highways with their fellow citizens. Parents and young drivers, why don't you get one of these agreements right away? They're yours for the asking. Just send a note to the Robert Young Good Drivers Club, care of your local NBC station, and we'll shoot the works right back at you. Well, I guess that just about does it. Can you think of anything else, Judge Foff? Yes, just one other thing. You know, I have a slightly selfish interest in your whole highway safety movement. How is that? Well... I figure that if you can get all the drivers of this country to operate their vehicles safely, carefully, and with simple, good old-fashioned American courtesy, well, every once in a while, fellows like me will have a chance to go fishing. Good night, Bob. Good night, Judge Bob, and thank you for coming. Like good things the easy way. Good things the easy way. Instant Maxwell House, that's for you. Good, good coffee that's easy too. No time, no trouble. No grounds, no fuss. And it's good to the very last. You, you know, know what? Yes, Instant Maxwell House means great coffee instantly in your cup. Here's real instant coffee. All pure Maxwell House coffee in instant form. Enjoy Instant Maxwell House. Instantly. Good to the very last. You know what? Join us again next week when we'll be back with Father Knows Best, starring Robert Young as Jim Anderson, with Roy Bargey and the Maxwell House Orchestra, and yours truly, Bill Foreman. Don't forget, parents and youngsters, For your voluntary pledges and membership cards, just write to the Robert Young Good Drivers Club, care of your local NBC station. Now it's time to say goodnight, so until next Thursday, good luck from the makers of Maxwell House, America's favorite brand of coffee. Always good to the last drop. Father Knows Best was transcribed in Hollywood and written by Ed James. Now stay tuned in for Screen Guild Theater, which follows immediately over most of these stations. Hear Dan Daly and Ann Baxter on Screen Guild Theater next on NBC.